Welcome back to Activism is Medicine. My name is Frank Ferencic, and today we're excited to welcome Guy McPherson to our conversation. Guy is a conservation biologist and one of the world's leading authorities on abrupt climate change and near-term human extinction. As a professor at the University of Arizona, Guy has lectured extensively around the world and his material can be found at naturebatslast.com. Hope you enjoy. So Frank, you want to do the intro? Sure. Yes. Um, well, my curiosity, we sometimes talk about people and their encounter with the knowledge. And by that, I mean the knowledge of the extremity, the gravity, the magnitude of our predicament. And I'm curious about how people respond to the knowledge. And this leads me to wonder about your personal history. And maybe, maybe you could give us a kind of a synopsis of that. Go back to when Guy McPherson was in high school, and then later on having this encounter with the knowledge and how that affected you personally and the trajectory of your life from there. Sure. So I went to high school. Well, I, I grew up in a small village in northern Idaho called Weipe, known only if you watch Ken Burns's documentary film, Core of Discovery, about Lewis and Clark. This is where the Lewis and Clark expedition first met the Nez Perce tribe and was on the Weite Prairie and a little village grew up there. Had three large sawmills when I was growing up there. I had the opportunity to go back a few years ago and they were down to zero large sawmills or zero sawmills of any kind. And in fact, all those enormous trees that surrounded me as I was growing up were all gone. There was just the occasional forest of toothpicks and so I grew up in the woods I grew up in a time I was born in 1960 I grew up in a time when at least in small towns people would let their children run wild I was an, a, a youngster who in in the summertime when school wasn't on my mom just expected to be home in time for dinner if I wanted dinner and if I didn't want to eat then I didn't have to get home till dark so sometimes one of the neighbor kids' mom would feed me. Anyway, so I grew up in this little town, moved to a smaller town my senior year in high school, then went to Idaho State University for a couple of years, played Division I basketball, majored in women's studies, and they didn't have a women's studies program there. I, I majored in unsuccessfully chasing women and basketball, and I was pretty unsuccessful at that as well. So after a couple of years, taking the advice of a supervisor at the Idaho Department of Lands, where I was a wildland firefighter, I moved to Moscow, Idaho, and got my degree in forestry, my undergraduate degree in forestry. Then I pursued successfully a master's and a PhD with Henry Albert Wright at Texas Tech University. Henry was the world's leading authority on fire ecology and prescribed fire at the time and for many years to come. And got my PhD there, went to a very short postdoctoral experience of only a few months at the University of Georgia with Susan Bratton. And I did my, my research on Cumberland Island, which is the southernmost of Georgia's barrier islands. And then my first Professor position was visiting assistant professor at Texas A&M University. I was there for one year, and then I was hired actually before I arrived at Texas Tech, but after I, I mean at Texas A&M, but after I'd committed to working there for a year, I received a tenure track offer from the University of Arizona. So I was at the University of Arizona for twenty years, starting on. May 1st, 1989, and ending on May 1st, 2009. I chose those dates because May 1st is the day we celebrate workers every place else in the world except for the United States. And so I was trying to make a an impact uh, even then. I left the University of Arizona when it became clear that they, like every other institution I've ever come across, 
they were all about the money. And I was interested in more things than just money, which is why I'm so poor now. And so I moved off grid for more than a decade, first in rural southwestern New Mexico, just about a, a mile and a half down river from the Gila Wilderness, first designated wilderness area in the world, and the largest wilderness area in the lower 48. I lived there for about eight years and then moved to Belize in Central America for a little over two years and lived off grid there as well. By this time, I had become aware of the aerosol masking effect and also the likelihood of uh, when a few nuclear power plants melt down catastrophically, that will cause the stripping away of stratospheric ozone and cause extremely rapid heating of the planet, probably sufficient to cause loss of habitat for all life on Earth. So I decided I wasn't doing much good living off grid and trying to influence people into doing the same thing because if a bunch of people did that, then we would destroy the planet even sooner than we're on track to do. It's pretty hard to believe. And so I started pursuing a more normal existence, primarily because my partner's youngest sister was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, sometimes called blood cancer. So we moved back to the States to deal with that and then to deal with her uh, Alzheimer's inflicted father, get him into a place and round and round we go. And finally, we ended up here in relatively rural Vermont um, about two years ago. So we're greatly enjoying this space. I, I just got, I'm sweating terribly because I was just unloading this winter's firewood from where the truck left it to under the deck where it'll presumably stay dry. So thank you all for asking me to participate in this conversation and I look forward to it. Sorry for the long introduction. No worries. Well, did you, was there a moment in your young adulthood where you had a epiphany or a realization of the extremity that we're facing and, and how did that, did that change you? Did that, how did that affect you? I'm a slow learner, so it took me a while to figure it out. I, I knew that I loved being outside because I grew up in this village surrounded by big trees. There was a creek running through town. We could drink the water right out of the creek. Can you even imagine drinking from a stream or a river in the continental United States today and not being seriously um, afflicted, we'll say, as a result? But that's what that's just what I did. So I knew I loved being outdoors, and that's why I pursued a degree in forestry, ultimately, and then master's and PhDs in range science. And I never, it never really occurred to me in a moment that we were headed for a complete disaster, much less a climate disaster. But after I'd taken a freshman biology course, back in the days when people were still allowed to teach and therefore to read Limits to Growth from the Club of Rome. I knew that by the time I was 19 years old in 1979, that I did not want to have kids because I could, I could not see the track we were on turning out to be positive for future generations, probably not even my generation, much less future generations. So... I managed to convince my wife of nearly 35 years to, and at the, the youngest of six Catholic children from the Midwestern United States, I convinced her to not have children, which is a pretty stunning accomplishment, perhaps the most important thing I've ever done. And I, I didn't realize until after I left campus life that the climate emergency was as bad as it is, or I would not have left campus. Because in, in leaving campus, I left a legal system that could have supported me through a coordinated defamation campaign that led to a renowned attorney by the name of Gerald Maples 
working pro bono on my half, behalf for a few years. And then ultimately he slipped on a dock in the Bahamas and died on December 4th, 2020. Took me almost two years to find another legal team willing to represent me. In this case, it was an attorney from Wyoming who said on September 30th that this will be an easy case, nothing to worry about. And then on October 8th, this is of last year, 2022, September 30th, he said, no problem, October 8th, he said, walk away. We can't have anything to do with this. By a social media, they had received horrifying images of somebody who went by the name The Eliminator. And so they were terrified. So now I just produce a couple of videos every week and try to inform people what's going on with the climate emergency, but no longer looking for legal help because bad things happen to people who represent me. And I think that's more than enough about that. Wow. Well, I just remember one question I asked you in our last interview three years ago, and that's whether or not you consider yourself an activist. And it, it, at the time, you identified with being a teacher and an educator. And do you still feel the same way? And what do you think about the whole idea of activism at this point in history? I'm I'm definitely still a teacher. I can't help myself. I realized after I left active service at the University of Arizona that I was born to teach, that I can't help myself. And so I continue doing that. So teaching is what I do. It's not just that a teacher, it, it's not just what I do. It's, it's actually who I am. I can't help myself. And so I keep putting out a couple of videos every week on YouTube on the Nature Bats Last channel, mm -hmm. which you can see behind me. Yeah. And I would consider that to be a form of activism. I'm trying to relay the facts rooted in peer-reviewed papers and occasionally the authors who write those peer-reviewed papers. So I would consider that a form of activism. Not everybody does, but I am no longer marching in the streets and joining active protests and that sort of thing for a couple of reasons. One, I don't have the time to get arrested. And two, I'm too old for that. You know, I, my back hurts so bad 24 seven that I get up and do back exercises two times during the night, or I, I can't even make it through the night. I've been going to a spine doctor near here and his latest was nothing we can do. I, I headed him off. I, I knew he was going to aim for surgery because we'd been through everything else. We went through radiation therapy to kill the nerves so that I couldn't feel pain. Mm -hmm. We went through epidural shots. And I thought only women giving birth got epidural shots, but no, it applies to people who are in serious pain as well. And so I thought he was going to suggest surgery. And so I headed him off and said, I don't want surgery because I suspect we don't have time for that to be a positive influence. And he says, oh, no, no, I wouldn't recommend surgery anyway. You're too far gone for that. And this was after he asked me what I did. And I told him about near-term human extinction. So maybe this was his punishment for me. No surgery for you. <laughs> <laughs> He's got kids living at home, and he wasn't happy to hear the message. I'm happy. And I try not to tell people, but he just kept pressing and pushing and, and begging me for tell him, to tell him what I do. So I finally told him, and then he wasn't a happy man. Hard what, to hear those things. John? What do you uh, think of climate activism, you know, putting aside the personal involvement, but the, the young people that are out there engaging in protests, you know, some whom uh, uh, do engage in nonviolent civil disobedience and get arrested. Given the the time frames that, that you seem to be talking about and 
some of your videos. What do you think about people that are out there still struggling against the against the system to try to slow things down and try to fix things? What's your opinion of that? Southwestern American writer and speaker Edward Abbey had a profound influence on me. I read him when I was in college. And that's probably why I turned to anarchism in my political life, because he was an anarchist. He received a master's degree at the University of New Mexico in, in anarchism. And so obviously I'm not a fan of governments or government entities. In addition, Edward Abbey wrote something and, and, and said similar things on a frequent basis. He wrote, action is the antidote to despair. And so if people are despairing about the world we live in, and I can understand that, then activism isn't a bad idea. I don't think it will, I, I, it depends upon the objectives of the people involved in the protests and the activism. If they're trying to inform people about the climate emergency, I think it's a great idea. For example, I was at a medical doctor. No, no, I was at a at an endodontist, which is you, you, your your dentist sends you to the endodontist when it's beyond their ability to fix, right? So I go to this endodontist, and the and the guy pokes around in my face for a while, and and he says, "What are you doing here? There's nothing wrong." And I said, "How much is this going to cost me? One hundred eighty-five dollars. One hundred eighty-five dollars. Find out there's nothing wrong. I think I'm going to switch dentists." And I was talking to his two staff members when I was leaving, you know, clearing up the paperwork and when I was going to get the bill paid and all that. And they had never heard of the mass extinction event underway. Most people have heard of the sixth mass extinction, although it's at least the ninth. And they never heard of that. And they never heard of climate change ever. Like, and, and these were pe pe people who were, I don't know, I'd say in their 40s and 50s, something like that. So I was stunned that they didn't, they weren't at all aware. And that reminded me that one of my goals in life is to make people aware. I'm a pretty good teacher. I won all kinds of awards. I was promoted to full professor, which happens to fewer than one in 200 people who get a PhD in the natural sciences. I was promoted to full professor before I turned 40, which basically never happens. And so I think I'm pretty good at this whole teaching thing. Oh, here's an example. I taught my dog to whistle. I taught and I taught and I taught. My dog never did learn to whistle. That told me there's a big difference between teaching and learning. And so I try to focus on learning now. In any event, <laughs> I think that as... I think that there's a Buddhist expression or a way of being that goes something like pursue action and don't be attached to the outcome. Mm. So I think pursue right action, actually. And so I think that the people who are protesting, who are from one perspective, throwing snowballs into a 90 mile an hour, 90 degree wind, I think that they're taking action. And if they are not, if they are attached to the outcome of informing people, I think that's great. If they're attached to the action, to the outcome of governments changing policy or us turning around abrupt, irreversible climate change, then I think that's problematic. But I'm certainly not going to discourage anybody from taking action that is pointed in the right direction of informing people and pointing out that governments do not have our backs. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, if, if I can, I'd, I'd love to, you know, a number of your videos walk through different elements of how you come to your conclusions. And I'm wondering if there's four or five steps from where we are now, which, you know, Tia Tawaki, right? So the end of the world as we know it, we've already passed that milestone in the rearview mirror a couple of years ago. But uh, as we head towards 
near-term human extinction in your mind, what what are the steps of, of that we're looking at? You've said uh, a couple of years ago, we're at least 1.75 Celsius above 1750, probably now well past two. What are the what are the observable steps that you see coming or that we're in the midst of and coming to get us to that point? Right. So in his October 9th, 2020 book, The Event Horizon, Andrew Glickson wrote, and I quote, during the Anthropocene, greenhouse gas forcing has risen by more than 2.0 watts per meter squared, equivalent to more than two degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures, which constitutes an abrupt event over a period not much longer than a lifetime, end quote. That was in 2020, and it takes a while to get a book published, probably three or four years. So we, and, and Glickson cites considerable peer-reviewed work to reach this conclusion. So yes, we're beyond two. And the whole idea of not exceeding two degrees C was so that we would not trigger self-reinforcing feedback loops. And even the political body trying to pawn itself off as a scientific body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, concluded that we had reached the point of irreversible climate change in in, let's see, September 24th, 2019, in the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a change in climate. And they concluded that an overheated ocean was responsible for the irreversibility of climate change in that report. Mm. They also, less than a year earlier, in their global warming of 1.5 degrees report from October 8th, 2018, they, they wrote based on peer-reviewed literature, these global level rates of human-driven change far exceed the rates of change driven by geophysical or biosphere forces that have altered the Earth system trajectory in the past. Even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human-driven change. So we're in the midst of the fastest environmental change in planetary history. Think about that for a minute. Approximately 66 million years ago, an interstellar body struck this Earth and drove the dinosaurs to extinction. We're going faster. Right. This event is faster than that. That's astonishing. I I don't know how many times I can say we're number one. Right. So what should we so, look for? So we can look for and and it's difficult, I admit. There's this is difficult to see, and I deal with this with individual email messages many times every day. Already, according to the peer-reviewed literature, we have exceeded, okay, the phrase they used was non-optimal temperatures. As a result of non-optimal temperatures, this is a paper from 2018, approximately, I don't have it right here with me. They concluded that non-optimal temperatures were driving about 5.1 million people to their deaths. That's a lot. These non-optimal temperatures are causing what I, I think we fail to focus on that we really should focus on a lot more, and that's habitat. We A report from 2013 by Quintero and Weens indicates that we are exceeding the rate of change for vertebrates by a factor of more than 10,000 times. More than 10,000 times. We're vertebrates. We should be <laughs> concerned. Much right. later, later paper indicates that mammals can't keep up with the rate of environmental change. We're vertebrates, we're mammals. So that puts us in two categories of can't keep up. That's seriously concerning. We, most of us in the global north, at least us privileged Caucasian people are not seeing the loss of habitat because it's not happening in our backyard. I thought that the pandemic might give a clue to some people, the, the empty shelves in the grocery stores. That's an indication of what's coming in a, at a far greater degree than just toilet paper and dairy goods. So I, I don't know what it's going to take for people to notice that we're losing habitat for human animals all around the world. 
it's happening particularly quickly in the tropical and subtropical areas as a result of lethal wet bulb temperatures. When you reach lethal wet bulb temperatures, your organs begin to fail. And I observed this in person in the time we were living in Belize because I was I was working for a few months um, building structures on the property. And then after a few months, the men I was working with said, please stop. I was a danger. <laughs> I'm not I'm not made, made for carrying two by fours because I turn around and whack somebody upside the head when, because I'm not paying attention, that sort of thing. But but we saw that people who, for example, had been hammering nails for their from the time they were eight years old and now they're in their 40s, they were hammering nails and suddenly they can't hit the nail with the hammer ever. And they're tripping. These are people who are in otherwise good health, but on hot, humid days, they were losing the ability to carry out relatively simple activities that they'd been doing for basically their entire lives and so we identified this as lethal wet bulb temperatures leading to organ failure so we stuck them in the swimming pool and had to cool off for a while just blowing wind will not do anything that does not reduce lethal wet bulb temperatures the, the wind coming up it's a combination of temperature and relative humidity that causes the lethal events as a result of organ failure. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. There's a, a friend who's a medical doctor in the Toronto, Ontario metropolitan area. And her, she's from Germany and she's living in Canada and has been for a long time. And her father died in a hospital in Germany and she diagnosed the reason from afar as lethal wet bulb temperatures because he was in a hospital that had no air conditioning, never needed it. We don't need air conditioning in, in that part of Germany, never needed it before. But then suddenly it's too warm there. And so he died and they couldn't keep up even in the hospital with what he was going through. So it's difficult because Habitat is comprised of several different factors, and most people are have no education in ecology or, or or conservation biology, so they can't acknowledge what habitat even is. They'll mm -hmm. notice when the food stops showing up at the grocery store or when the water stops coming through the taps, but by then it's a little too late to have any positive impact. Right. So I, I'm not sure what to do other than point people towards the the evidence and try to show people that we are very close to the edge here. Hmm. Let me ask a question along those lines. I don't know, are you familiar with uh, Luke Kemp? And uh, there's a Cambridge study where they've asked the IPCC to look into a catastrophic climate change scenarios. And they wrote a paper last year because obviously that's not happening. No, no one is looking at that at that option. And I thought that the paper itself was interesting, and it they seem to take it to the next step. In other words, it's one thing to explain the science, and you know we can agree with all of the scientific findings. For example, that you cited the other day in your video. Uh, science snippets but this group seems to be taking it another step and, and they reference the four horsemen of uh of human mortality famine extreme weather armed conflict and vector-borne diseases mm -hmm. and it, it's but if you look at what they're saying they're talking about for example Billions of people will be under very severe threats by 2070. And, and they're talking about 2040 and two, they're picking out different dates. And it seems to me that those dates are 
quite a bit longer than the ones that you're expressing. Do you, do you, yes. how, how, can you uh, try to give us an idea of how some of these factors that I just mentioned could come about in a relatively short period of time? Sure. And first of all, the reason I started my blog at GuyMcPherson.com is because I gave a graduation address in August 2007, I think. And next thing I know, I'm getting email messages from all over the world misquoting my, my commencement address. And there were a couple of hundred people there. And I wanted to make sure that there was a relatively clean version of what I, what I had actually said. So that's why I started my blog. And I included the four horsemen in that address. So I'm familiar with the idea. Now, how could, how could we essentially lose habitat in a relatively short period of time? The fastest way we can lose habitat globally in a very short period of time is to have an ice-free Arctic Ocean. Jennifer McKinnon at the Scripps Institution, which is part of the Scripps Institute, and also she's at the University of California, San Diego, said upon release of a paper in Natural Communications, in Nature Communications, which is an open access paper, um, she was quoted in CBS News on April 23rd, 2021, and she said she expects a nice free Arctic in 2022. Well, that didn't happen. James Anderson, the Harvard atmospheric scientist famous for discovering the link between chlorofluorocarbons and the Antarctic ozone hole, said to Forbes on January 15th, 2018, after giving an address in Chicago, quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero. So he says this year, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that we're going to have an ice free Arctic Ocean. But we aren't, fortunately. The U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, just a couple of years ago, started putting together a six-month ensemble forecast after they, after the, a, a group of professors and researchers put out a paper in the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences, incorrectly projecting an ice-free Arctic Ocean to occur in 2016, plus or minus three years. So just a couple of years ago, and, and they missed that, obviously. We didn't have an ice-free Arctic, Arctic Ocean in 2016, plus or minus three years. The, the latest date would be 2019. And so that didn't happen. And so now they're using this very scientifically conservative approach in forecasting or predicting what the level of ice will be at the end of the year. And right now, their six-month ensemble forecast shows there will be about 4.66 million square kilometers of ice floating on the Arctic Ocean on September 17th, which will be the low point for Arctic ice this year. So that's good news. Does that mean it's not going to happen next year? Of course it could happen next year or the year after. These are two well-known professors who predicted it last year and this year, and they're very knowledgeable folks. Could it happen next year? Yes. How soon after that do things start to fall apart? Well, according to a peer-reviewed paper in Geophysical Research Letters written by Christina, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, P-I-S-T-O-N-E, P-Stone, A, maybe, and colleagues, and published on June 20th, 2019, the transition to an ice-free Arctic Ocean from one that has ice on it is equivalent to more than 25 years of contemporary emissions. So what that means is just from the loss of albedo or reflectance, right. we will experience the equivalent of about 27 and a half years, the last 27 and a half years of carbon dioxide emissions. That's going to be catastrophic. We'll, that will be observed in mid to late September. And then the following year, they say in their paper that in May, the catastrophic loss of habitat will begin. 
And I can't imagine there will be habitat for human animals within a year after that happens all over the globe. We are already seeing crossing of the jet streams, the northern and southern hemisphere jet streams occurring. And this is the kind of thing that scientists hadn't predicted would occur until 2050 or 2070 or 2100. And that that's the path I was on when I left active service at the University of Arizona was we had a long time. And so that's why I started, one of the reasons I started living off, off grid was not only to set an example for other people to reduce their carbon footprints, but also to ensure my own survival. Turns out that was a bad idea. So, so I strongly suspect based on the peer reviewed literature that we're headed for an ice free Arctic in the relatively near term. And it'll be a year after that best case scenario before we have no habitat for humans anywhere on the planet. You know, I'm not happy about that. It's not like this brings me great joy to point out to people that we're irrevocably screwed. Right. But it is what it is. And as a teacher, I must rely upon evidence to present the information. But by no habitat, you mean it will be too hot? Or do you mean too hot some places? Weather, or do you mean there will be international conflict? What I, I guess I want to make sure I'm taking that you know step A to step B to step C. Right, there will be at least all of those three. We're already seeing water wars, as described by Lester Brown in the 1970s, because water wars are manifest in the form of grain wars. Mm -hmm. One of the really good grain growing regions in the world is in the Ukraine. Hmm. Interesting. They also have fossil fuels there, in some abundance. So how this plays out step by step is, is pretty darn difficult to estimate, but loss of habitat means that we no longer are able to grow food for ourselves. And every civilization in history so far has depend upon, depended upon the ability to grow, store, and distribute grains at a large scale. Right. If right. we're not able to do that, then civilization collapses. When civilization collapses because of the aerosol massing effect, the temperature heats up by 55% overall and by 133% over land, according to the peer-reviewed literature. And most of us live on land, and so that's problematic. And that rapid increase in temperature, it isn't that we can't deal with it right? We have fans, we have air conditioning, we have water, we have these things that allow us to cool off. But the world surrounding us doesn't. There's no way that the woodchucks wreaking havoc on my garden are going to survive rapid rates of environmental change. Right. In the short term, that's good <laughs> because the woodchuck won't be able to eat. In the long term, that's bad because if the woodchuck can't eat, then I can't eat either. Right. And I recently discovered why they're sometimes called whistle pigs. I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. They whistle. These things are out there just whistling, enjoying their life, eating from our garden and whistling. <laughs> life, life is not fair. Life is not fair. You know, uh, you're speaking exactly to what's already happened in the Pacific Northwest where Frank and I live. Two years ago, we had here, you know, 116 degrees in Portland, Oregon, and that was a full 30 degrees Fahrenheit above average reported temperatures for the past 50 years, and uh, e even higher than before that, right? So it's it's hard for people to imagine and understand. It's not just the baseline temperature; it's the sudden heat spikes and the heat domes that happen, and we're seeing those happen more and more because of the destabilization, right, in the atmosphere. And then you see like Phoenix, where they've had 31 days over 110 in a row. It's madness. Right, 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 absolutely. There's a good friend of mine who lives in Portland, Oregon, and she was, for her entire adult life, she was an anti-nuclear activist. Mm -hmm. And then she reads the evidence, finds out that it's going to take 50 or 60 years to decommission 
a single nuclear power plant. We haven't started on that project yet. And so immediately she became an activist for the homeless. And mm -hmm. so that's what she's been doing for the last several years is voluntarily working on behalf of the homeless, to put people into homes, because that's something that she can do, that we can do in our own town that will benefit people around us. And that's what I encourage other people to do as well. We, I don't think we can stop what's coming. I don't think there's, you know, if the political body known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concludes that we're in the midst of the most rapid event in planetary history, and it's all bad and it's irreversible, then I don't think we're gonna stop this. So what can we do in the time we have left besides hoping and praying that it's longer than I think it is, we can take care of ourselves. We can take care of our neighbors. We can take care of our family and friends. We can treat everybody we know as if they are our dying grandmother in her last days. Two interesting things about that, because it's a two-way interaction. You would never lie to your dying grandmother, and she would know anyway. And she would never lie to you. She's dying. She knows she has a short time left. She's not going to lie to you. She's going to tell you the truth. So let's have that kind of arrangement with the people we know and love. And then at the next level of what I've been calling planetary hospice for many years, at the next level, the level of community, the communities in which we live, let's try to arrest, let's try to address the horrible factors such as homelessness and racism and misogyny. You know, those afflict every civilization and certainly they're found in every large city. So let's try to fix that. Let's go to the city council meetings and point out that there are people dying in the streets in our town. How can we let that happen? Everybody's going to be dying soon enough. Let's not rush some people along just because they're poor, because they were born to the wrong parents. They were born at the wrong time in the wrong place. And then at the, at the planetary level, I encourage everybody to do whatever it takes to decommission the nuclear power plants as rapidly as we can. There's more than 450 of them around the world. And when a few of them melt down, they're going to strip away stratospheric ozone. That ionizing radiation is going to strip away stratospheric ozone and cause a superheating of the planet. As depicted in the 2021 film Finch, Finch like the bird, that was the name of the character played by Tom Hanks. And it pointed out, and you know, it went a little overboard. They'd stick their hand out in the sun and it'd, it'd sunburn in a matter of seconds when actually it would probably take a few minutes, not a few seconds, but artistic license, right? So let's try to make sure that doesn't happen because that will certainly, without any doubt in my mind at all, or in the minds of the people who write peer reviewed papers, that will cause loss of habitat in very short order for every species on the planet. Is that is that the legacy we want to leave? I wouldn't think so. Right, right. That's the um, the big question. If if we were to have a future, you know, what would the future historians be writing about us and how we responded to this challenge? Uh, did we fight back, or did we right. accept it in a honorable way, or did we just become apathetic and and do nothing i mean what what are these <laughs> everybody's asking how to live now what's the spiritual way to live go down fighting is this like a rocky balboa situation where we're going to fight apollo creed and we know we're going to lose but you got to keep fighting because that's just the nature of humans or is it more like in the movie don't look up where there was that near uh, that scene near the end where the people gathered in the dining room and they had that time with their family and friends just before the asteroids. Right? That's another honorable way to live. Right. And that was beautiful. That was the best part about that film was the end where everybody gathered together. And the signature line was, we really did have everything, didn't we? And they all got together, the family and friends, to, to enjoy their, what turned out to be their last supper. 
Mm -hmm. right? That was that was amazing. And so I encourage people to do those kinds of things. Be with the ones you love. If you can't be with the ones you love, then love the ones you're with. Oh, that's a song, isn't Where it? Where have I heard that? <laughs> you know, there are so many things we can do individually and as a community and collectively to make other people's lives less miserable. And we share something on the, the the four people involved in this conversation as near as i can tell are all caucasian men we are at the apex of privilege right we we just show up and we get privileges thrown our way for no good reason at all and that's wonderful but let's take advantage of our inherent privilege and try to make sure that life for other people who don't share the conditions we were born into right have a have a chance of having a decent life and I, you know i think that's really important that we pursue that option because there are so many people struggling greatly just to get through every day and there are things that we can do as privileged people to alleviate some of that burden Let me ask you, what do you, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Frank. Oh, did you had a little model, I think it was called the seven threes. Did, does this ring a bell? What you could do if you had three seconds, three minutes, yes. three hours. Do you want to refresh our memory on that? Yes. So if you have three seconds, there's very little you can do, right? So you see a, a nuclear detonation, you see the mushroom cloud, and you, you look out the window and and suddenly it's getting really warm and you realize you have no time. You have three seconds. What can you do? Nothing. You can express gratitude for a life well lived or maybe blink through a couple of the regrets that you have. On the other hand, if you have three minutes compared to three seconds, that's a long time. Imagine that the, the voice comes on the radio as you see the mushroom cloud and it's the voice says that you have three minutes right here where we live on the coast. We have three minutes before the impacts. Then one, three minutes, you can call one or two people. You can say goodbye. You can wish people well. You can, if you have a God, you can pray, right? There, there's a lot of things you can do in three minutes that you can't do in three seconds. And then three hours, holy cow, three hours. You know, most of us think three hours is nothing. With my back, three hours of sleep seems like a really long time. But we can all, through the way we live, if we express gratitude, appreciation, love for our fate, three hours can seem like a very long time, depending upon how we spend it, who we spend it with. So especially compared to three minutes or three seconds, three hours seems like forever. And then extend that to three days, three weeks, three months, three years, and be grateful for the time that you have. Mm -hmm. Based on the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School's six-month ensemble forecast, we have at least an another year and a half, almost certainly, all of us. Well, compare in your mind that year and a half to three minutes or three hours or even three days. Mm -hmm. Think of the things you can get done if you actually pursue a life worth living. I'm, I'm, I'm currently in the midst of reading a couple of books I read at the Existential Cafe by Sarah Bakewell, Sarah with an H, and I'm currently reading How to Live. And, and she's She's famous for these long titles. It's How to Live or A Life of Montaigne in One Question and 20 Attempts at an Answer. That's the title, and it takes up the whole cover. <laughs> and I, I, shortly after I assumed my professor position at the University of Arizona, it occurred to me that here I was a PhD, that means Doctor of Philosophy, and I had never completed a philosophy course 
as an undergraduate or a graduate student. And I thought, well, that's screwed up. Actually, I didn't say screwed, but we have standards here. So I, I thought, that's a, that's a mess. How could I have not, how can I call myself a doctor of philosophy? And, and I don't know anything about philosophy. So I spent the next year and a half reading everything I could get my hands on, going back to the ancients, going back to Plato, and reading as much as I could. And that's one of the reasons that I've continued to read Sarah Bakewell and, and her books, is because the ancients and more contemporary philosophers have actually thought about things like how to live. The book I'm reading now by Sarah Bakewell is called How to Live or A Life of Montaigne in one question and 20 attempts at an answer, which is a heck of a title. And so I've been trying to focus for the last, that must be almost 30 years now, on how I actually live, how it affects the people around me, close to me, far from me. You know, we all do, you know, you're all familiar with the butterfly effect. So we all do things that have an impact on people far away that we will never meet, that we will never see, that we will never hear about. How we live is important as individuals. And to the extent that we can positively influence the way other people live, then I think that's a pretty good idea too. And you brought up Homer, right? And how the gods would envy us because of our mortality. Do you remember exactly. that? Exactly. Yes. In the Hill in the Iliad, Homer writes something like, Any moment might be your last. And in the in the paragraph before that, he's explaining that this is beneficial. Because unlike the gods, any moment for us might be our last. We might die at any time. And as a result, if we want, we can live with gratitude for the life we've been given. The gods have no such ability. The gods, why bother sniffing a flower for crying out loud? There's plenty of flowers. There's millions of years worth of flowers ahead for the gods. They live forever. What a curse. What a curse it would be to live forever. And many other people have followed along those lines. After Homer in the Iliad, there was the uh, Gulliver's Travels, right? And most people only remember the one story from Gulliver's Travels, but Gulliver went to a place where people lived forever. And it was miserable. It was so His social commentary, and this is what in the 1700s, was demonstrating that the things we really think we want to be bigger, to be smaller, to be to live longer, to do all these things, they're all miserable. All of which tells me amor fati. Amor fati is a Greek expression that means love your fate. Amor, like amorous, and fati, love your fate. So love one's own fate. And and look at how look how fate has dealt with us so far. We've, we've been in good shape. We live to a relatively old age compared to his prehistorical conditions and even historical conditions. We've all lived a long, long time. And so if we haven't had time to have a good run at this point, then some of that might be our fault. Yep. Wise words. John, J Lo, you got anything? No, I'll, I'll only say that I've read both those books you just cited. They're both very good, especially The Existentialist Cafe. Good summary. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. That that book came later. I think that was 2018. And I had a hard time getting through it because I'd spent a long time looking at all of those concepts, reading much of what she wrote in there. And so it sort of dragged on for me. Montaigne, on the other hand, is somebody with which I'm only marginally familiar. So reading through the lens of his life has been far more captivating for me. But I would recommend both books, and, and I don't get a royalty for either one. Well, certainly reading a short article like On Virtue by Montaigne, rather than struggling through existence and being by right. Sartre is a, you know, he... You've got to sort of plan your life ahead if you're going to tackle it. <laughs> <Right. laughs> 
and that, and that, and that you, know, you know, and that's a tough balance sometimes. Yeah. Because we all know that life is short. We don't know how short, but we don't want to do things that are unpleasant. And yet we want to do things. Right? So it's tough to strike that balance between doing things that we're going to appreciate and and just pissing away our time. Well, we're coming up on an hour here, but I did have one final question, I guess, uh, unless you guys have anything more, but I, I'm working with some young people now, some high school students, and they're they're very passionate about activism and they're doing things like electrify the city of Bend. That's one of their pet projects. And I'm reminded as some people are talking about electrifying the Titanic, right? Is that's a, a similar idea there? But uh, what do you what do you say to young people? Well, a couple of things. One we know based on five peer-reviewed papers written by Tim Garrett at the University of Utah that civilization itself is a heat engine. Civilization is a heat engine. It doesn't matter how you power the damn thing. Civilization is a heat engine. In the first paper he submitted and it was accepted and it was it was published and then there was this enormous outcry from groups of professors at various universities because civilization can't be a heat engine we're the civilized people so the paper was pulled from publication hmm. and it took i think 14 months before it appeared again and only with responses from two research groups to which Garrett was not allowed to respond himself. So that seems a little unfair. Anyway, civilization is a heat engine. So it's going to be, and, and when we lose civilization, we have that massive overheating from the nuclear power plants melting down, stripping away stratospheric ozone. And we also have the aerosol masking effect that comes into play. So losing civilization is not a great idea in other words at this point you know it was different several thousand years ago before we had managed to completely muck up the atmosphere but now we're in the situation where we really do have the ability to cause the extinction of all life on earth in a relatively short period of time i think pointing that out to people is important i think encouraging people to act accordingly is a good idea but again not being attached to the outcome two two phrases from edward abbey southwestern american writer come to mind action is the antidote to despair and i know a lot of people who despair because they don't know what they can do so take action and then the other line from edward abbey when the situation is hopeless there's nothing to worry about <laughs> wow <laughs> and as nearly as i can tell based on the what the political body the intergovernmental panel on climate change what they write the situation is hopeless we're in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change the most abrupt in planetary history right. now does that mean we don't have another day no of course not does that mean we don't have another 10 years almost certainly when the situation is hopeless there's nothing to worry about i love that line because we need not worry we must just get on with our lives yes we can tell people what's coming but don't even be too excited about that i tell people and they just hate me for it mm. you know i tell people about the peer-reviewed literature and well there's this coordinated defamation campaign that removed me from public service and then ultimately led to every member of my family all of my former graduate students who used to love me and I love them and we spent thousands of hours in the field together. Now that they're, they're no longer part of my life, they've made it clear that they want nothing to do with me because of, you know, things they read on social media. Uh, but again, Amor Fati, I love my fate. I was born at the right time to the right parents. I was born in a small village in northern Idaho, where I get to drink the water out of Low Low Creek and have adventures, the likes of which most people today couldn't even imagine. Right. When we spoke with Michael Dowd, we 
had a reaction at the end of his conversation and we found it oddly inspiring. And that, I, I get the same feeling here as well. I mean, yes, the challenge is right in our face, but there, there is medicine here, I suppose you'd say. Right. And not only that, action is the antidote to despair. Even if we can't fix it, we still should take right action. That's my opinion anyway. Right. And and that's that's the Buddhist perspective for a long time is take right action, don't be attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. So we can do things that are right. Now, that said, I am not a fan of encouraging young people to get thrown in jail for their protests. So I'm not a fan of young people losing days or weeks of their lives because they get tossed tossed in the clink for their illegal activity. So so there's a line here. And and I suspect the line gets drawn at a different place for every single person. And I'm not here to tell anybody where to draw their line. But we are in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. Think about that before you do some things that gets you potentially thrown in jail for the rest of your life. And some of these sentences are coming down, even if it's only a few years, that might be all we have left. So I, I guess I would encourage people to pay attention to that. Yeah. Oh, now I'm a bummer again. Jeez, can we go back to the party part? <laughs> <sighs> John, j -Lo, you guys got anything else? No, this has been very, uh, very helpful to talk with you guys. I really appreciate you uh, yeah. coming here today and sharing your thoughts. And uh, I think it's been uh, very helpful for all of us. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Well, at this point in the conversation, um, interviewers usually ask about your future plans. What are your future plans? <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like kind of an odd question, but but why not? I mean, what are your near term plans? I I have dinner planned for tonight. It's leftover spaghetti. Okay. Okay. Beyond that, well, I'm going to take my pain pills so that I can get a couple hours of sleep tonight. Okay. That's about it, really. You know, because of this coordinated defamation campaign, I have lost almost everything. What remains is my integrity, uh, a beautiful, lovely woman who lives with me, and the respect of a few people, maybe even more than a few. Yeah. And that's that's more than a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. I can't complain. And it, that reminds me of one of my college roommates used to say all the time, whether you're saying hello or how you doing or whatever it is. Dave would always respond with, it don't do no good to bitch. <laughs> yeah. So we got that going for us, too. I have a final question. What are you growing in your garden? Well, first of all, mostly it's my partner's garden. <laughs> because she's been gardening since she was 14 years old. So she's got a better grip on this than I do. She's growing some perennials, including berries, raspberries, blackberries, and she's growing asparagus and then a whole bunch of annuals carrots potatoes you know sort of the 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 meat and potatoes the potatoes part of living that kind of life and and that gives me the opportunity to bring up something that we haven't really talked about but that frequently comes up is how how are we preparing and when I lived in New Mexico, I was off grid. And then when we lived in Belize, we were off grid. And I, I really thought that I could be with the people I loved for the first six or eight years of living off grid. I thought that this was going to extend our lives sufficiently that I would be able to stay with the woman I was married to until we were 100 years old. And so I took it very seriously gardening was a full-time job for me but now now that i have well 
somebody on social media accused me of causing extinction next Tuesday, every next Tuesday. So I'm pretty sure we have till next Tuesday. So I do garden a little. We do have what we call apocalypse food. This this stuff that's that stays edible for an extended period of time. And we have a water filter. So mm -hmm. if if the grid goes down and that only lasts for four or five weeks, we'll probably survive. And if the grid comes back again, and therefore the nuclear power plants don't melt down, then we will have gotten through that bottleneck and live to see another day, as they say. And we're not really interested. We don't, we don't unlike when I lived in New Mexico off grid and had more than a ton each of wheat berries, honey, because I'm a serious honey fanatic, spaghetti, rice, and beans. Okay, that was all stored in a root cellar, more than a ton each of all of those, because I was going to live forever. Well, now I realize that forever is a long time, especially with this back. And also, there's no way, there's no way that we make it for an extended period of time, because civilization is a heat engine that is overheating the planet. Um, in, in a paper in the Proceedings National Academy of Sciences by K.D. Burke and colleagues, they indicate that climates like those of the Pliocene will prevail as soon as 2030. And they ignore all self-reinforcing feedback loops and they ignore the aerosol masking effect. Hmm. So that tells me that even ignoring those important factors, we only have till 2030, that tells me that we don't have long. I'm going to live with gratitude. I'm going to live with love for the people in my life. And there are still four or five of them left. That's kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, in the event that we are around for a while, uh, we'd love to have you back <laughs> and stay in touch at any rate. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with all of you, and I look forward to being wrong about everything I say. There's nothing that would make me happier. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you guys. All right, guy. Take care. Thanks, guy. And thanks for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Guy McPherson. And if you have any questions about activism as medicine, feel free to reach out at activismismedicine.net, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers.